I'm Lindsay Davis, coach and guide helping heart-centered, aspiring visionaries reconnect with their mission and develop the resilience they need to bring that vision to life without losing who they are. With me today for this creative conversation is Evelyn Baker. Evelyn works and resides in beautiful Buena Vista, Colorado. She has over 20 years of professional experience in the arts, six of which have been dedicated to the field of glass fusing. Through her art, she strives to capture the intricacies of nature through keen observation and attention to detail. Evelyn finds inspiration in experimenting with traditional and non-traditional casting and mold techniques to depict the beauty around her. In addition to being a professional artist, Evelyn's background includes such diversity as working as a graphic artist and illustrator, an advertising manager, and senior illustrator for the Department of the Army, as well as a test engineer for a large U.S. defense contractor. She credits her dedication to continual learning and her background as a test engineer as invaluable in shaping the discipline necessary for the methodical, detailed testing required to create the complex firing schedules for her particular method. It is her pleasure to now share this technique and her art through teaching other artists as well as through the display and sale of her glass sculptures. Today, listen for overall themes around passion, tenacity, and commitment. Thanks for being here today. I've known you for a long time. (laughs) We won't get into how long that's been. (laughs) Right. It seems like lifetimes ago. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I know um, mentioned in the introduction that you're an artist. Yes. Over the years, you've had quite a few mediums. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit about your current your current medium. You use glass. Yes, yeah. currently I'm working in glass, uh, specifically fused glass, which is kiln form glass. It's also called warm glass. Glass generally is broken down into three different categories. Cold glass is what we consider to be traditional stained glass, what you see in church windows or you know, your front door, anything like that, because the entire process is done cold. Hot glass, which is blown glass, is done at very high temperatures, um, and that's why they call it hot glass. Warm glass is in the middle Mm -hmm. and generally takes place in the 13, 14, 1500 degrees. So even though, yes, it's hot, it's it's done at warmer temperatures mm-hmm. than colder, you know, than the cold to the co- warmer than the cold, cooler than the hot. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's is it the medium temperature that you're currently mostly using? No, generally for my work, um, the hotter you get, the smoother the glass gets. One of the first rules that you learn is that glass wants to be um, about a quarter of an inch thick, mm-hmm. and that becomes a very smooth, even glass. I like a lot of texture, so I push the lowest possible temperatures that I can where the fusion, fusion process still takes place. Yeah. So the particles of the glass need to be able to bond and fuse together, but I work as low as I can at those temperatures where that happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Seems like there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of technique. How did you pick glass? <laughs> How did you get into glass? Uh, that's part of my journey. I used to work as a um, watercolorist and painted with oils and acrylics. My style just naturally was very, very realistic. And I intentionally put it aside for a while, uh, went back to a professional career, and told myself that when I get back into art, I wanted it to be something that would force me to be loose, 
so I chose stained glass. It's um, just because of the limitations of glass itself, you cannot be realistic in it. Mm -hmm. You have to take something that's realistic, interpret it, and use it within the confines of cold glass. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it forced me to do that. Um, I took a fused glass glass because I thought, well, I would make some pieces and incorporate them into my stained glass. As soon as I took my first fused glass class, I was hooked. I now know what passion mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I live it, I breathe it, I think about it. It's always in the back of my mind on what I can do next with glass and how can I do that. Yeah, so it really sounded like you found that thing that really lights you up. Yes. Yeah, it and makes you, I, I've heard it said, uh, it makes you forget to eat and brush your teeth. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about eating, but <laughs> it can certainly make you forget about a lot of other things. And, you know, that's where part of the balance of life comes in, too. Mm -hmm. You have obligations, so you have to set it aside sometimes. But Yeah, and that makes me curious, I mean, to hear about how you've balanced everyday life because uh, you also, you're married. I'm married. And you, you're married to a very ambitious gentleman as well. Um, you guys have been, I know, business owners. Right. A really successful uh, local business. And uh, so I know art takes, uh, you have more space to, to do your art now, but how do you balance your creative work with your everyday life? Well, fortunately, married to Keith, um, he feels that not only is he in his prime as far as what his career has wanted to be, he recognizes that for me as well. Mm -hmm. We're in our early 60s, and so we're at a place in life where our other professions have allowed us to be now where we are so we have a lot of flexibility um, the daughters are no longer at home mm -hmm. they were they're his daughters although you know I consider them to be mine as well um, so we don't have those types of constraints on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. he gets up and goes to a lot of meetings I get up and go to my studio and the beauty of having my studio at home is like this morning, I woke up at 3 o'clock, by 4 o'clock, realized I couldn't get back to sleep, so I got up and started working, and I got something into my kiln before I came for this interview, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and it's really nice, uh, I don't know, I feel like that's part of the joy of having something you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily feel like work. Oh, and absolutely does not and feel so, like work. Yeah, so it's like whenever, it sounds like whenever you get to do it, you're happy to be right. Be in your shop and your studio. And in my early days of painting, I was in my early 30s, I had a good full-time job, and I decided to go to work part-time and pursue painting. And I was living in the Washington, D.C. area. And I did get to the point where it felt like work. And if I didn't paint, if I didn't produce something, if I couldn't sell it, then bills weren't going to get paid. Mm -hmm. And I made a very, very conscious decision at that time to go back to work full-time professionally, um, which really wasn't related to my artwork at all. Mm -hmm. Work, save, put the money in the 401k, so that at this point in life, I could be where I am. And fortunately for me, it has worked out that way. Mm -hmm. So I made some conscious decisions, but um, because the painting was starting to feel like work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want my art to be my work. Yeah, did you feel like it was because you were painting, you hadn't found your glass work yet, or do you feel like it was the money pressure? I think it was more... Um, the pressures of by that time um, you know I was I was married not my not to Keith but um, my ex-husband and 
we had a house. We lived in the D.C. suburbs. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, you know, financial obligations. I was also trying to finish school. Just a lot of other things that happen to you when you're in your 30s, you don't get those freedoms mm -hmm. that can come later in life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want the added pressure of trying to be an artist and survive as an artist. Mm -hmm. I was too old to be a starving artist. <laughs> <laughs> Already had house payments and car payments and things like that, and I didn't want to go back to being a starving artist. So Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And it's... Uh, you know, I've, I've actually heard this from, um, there's a there's a coach that uh, I've heard mention, reference having a passion work and then having an income work. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's what worked for you was to take the pressure of having to create and having to perform Correct. at that level and, and instead find a way to make a living while that was the most important priority at right. that point and, and really hold space that you were coming back to your yes. art. I really hear like a determination yes. in you that like it was a very intentional decision mm -hmm. and you knew that you were coming back yes. to your art. Right. Yeah. And I didn't realize at the time, you know, although I knew I wanted it to be something different than painting mm -hmm. and I'd always been interested in stained glass, um, I had no idea that it would be what it is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where it is so consuming. Yeah. I still hadn't found that passion that I have now. Yeah. Yeah, what would you, I'm springing this on you a little bit, but what would you tell someone who is wanting to transition? They have something creative that's maybe a hobby and they're wanting to explore doing it for a living, what would you, if you could give them advice? First of all, it's not easy. It is work. Mm -hmm. um, even though, you know, I recognize that I have what I believe are God-given talents, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that I can just sit down and things will flow from my hands mm -hmm. or that I'll have a vision and it just works out. It takes a lot of work. I study. Mm -hmm. I probably read anywhere from an hour to two to three hours, depending on the day and how I'm feeling. Sometimes I don't want to be in my studio or I need to do some research. Um, so I might be sitting on my sofa, but I'm researching, I'm studying, I'm looking. Um, it. And I found that with painting as well. Even though you have the talent, if you don't keep up the technique, your talent's not going to get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to work at it as much as what there is talent that's involved, I believe. Yeah. And yeah. my professional career, I ended up being um, a test engineer on large defense contracts for the um, for a couple of private companies that work, you know, for the U.S. government, um, it taught me the discipline and the tenacity to dig deeper mm -hmm. and to find out, okay, if this isn't working and it's supposed to work, whether it's hardware or software or combination, you know, integration between the two, it's like why, what. Why is it working this time and it's not working that time? Mm -hmm. And so I think that background helps me a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's actually a really unique uh, skill set for a creative or an artist to have, is that tenacity to, to practice what I call in my, in my process the experimental mindset, mm -hmm. where you set an experiment of what you want to accomplish and then you go about doing it but when it doesn't work, and instead of scrapping the model completely and starting right. completely over or quitting, it's having that, that scientific mindset to really ask the creative questions, what about that didn't work? How could we improve on this model? What are we not seeing here? And make those smaller tweaks right. so that you're progressively increasing 
your and capability. The interesting thing about um, fused glass or glass in general is well, once you start introducing heat to it, uh, for instance, the other day I was trying to determine the point, the temperature at which glass starts to fuse together, those particles start to fuse together. Well, there is no single answer. There's a temperature range because different colors of glass fuse, start to fuse at different times. So if I'm working with white glass, which I've been doing a lot of lately, it's going to probably fuse at a little higher temperature than black. But that little bit higher might only be 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of experimentation. I take, um, I take notes, but I also document a lot with photographs, different steps of the process so that I can go back and look at it. I know at what, you know, how I program the kiln. So if it was successful, making sure that I record that. Again, just working through step by step. And if it didn't work out, okay, how can I do it? Try it again. Yeah. What What can I do differently to make it work? Yeah, and that really resonates with me. I feel like um, intentional assessment mm -hmm. is a really big part of of any process, whether we're talking about honing a creative craft or an art. Um, I consider my work my craft. Yes. And, and just assessment, I can't probably overemphasize enough the value of right. that. Uh, to constantly be engaged in the process. And even you mentioned going back to what you were saying about the commitment mm -hmm. to always learning and always tweaking things and seeing what you can improve and what you can learn. Um, that commitment level, I have to agree with you, it completely surpasses whatever raw talent right. you were given initially to work with. And I feel like the raw talent gives you something that you enjoy. Right. Probably. Yes. <laughs> um, but then what you do with that, that's that's up to you. In the kind of well, and I do get a little bit, um, I'll use the word miffed, mm. when people say, oh, you're so talented. And I'm not saying that I haven't been given God-given talents, but just because he gave me those talents doesn't mean it's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. You still have to work at it, just like you have to get up every morning and go to your job, whether you're a nurse or a teacher or a doctor, whatever, you're working and using what you have. Well, I do the same thing in my studio. Mm -hmm. I work at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it's the combination of those things that I believe makes it successful. Well, and I mean, it shows in the quality of your work. You're doing things with glass now that it puts you in a very, there's a very few percentage of people, uh, very, very little people who can do what you do. I'm, and, yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping that's mm -hmm. the case. <laughs> the path that I'm headed down, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like um, this is what what holds back a lot of, a lot of people, because they'll have this raw, this raw gift, mm -hmm. and they'll start down it, and especially when they you know, try to look at, I want to do this more than just a weekend hobby. I really want to do this with my life. Mm -hmm. um, it tends to start to lose some of its luster when they realize that there there is commitment involved and right. there is discipline, mm -hmm. uh, really. And, um, yeah, what would be, what would you say keeps the joy alive for you with it? Um, that's a really good question. I think mostly that when I feel like I have taken on a project, a particular piece, for instance, right now I'm working, I'm trying to recreate some bones in glass. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly my most challenging project that I've done to date. Um, I have to get the accuracy, the whole mold process is... I believe um, a little different than what is generally being done and taught out there. 
so I'm having to experiment and learn a lot on my own. But the fact that I've had success in getting that done, uh, making the first couple of pieces, then it's like, okay, well, now what can I do? How much harder? I guess I'm one of those people that just keeps trying to make it, well, that wasn't as hard as I thought, so let me see if I can do something <laughs> harder. <laughs> Yeah, it's that challenge. But, you know, you talk about your process with glass, and and you almost seem like you get immersed in this world. You're wanting to even do it at, you know, 3, 4 a.m., right? Like when you can't sleep. (laughs) Um, But um, that's the very definition of flow, I feel like, is when you're in that zone uh, where it's challenging enough that it keeps you engaged in the process, but you also have the capability that when you can center and be present with the current challenge, you know you can meet that challenge. Right. You know, maybe not that minute, maybe not that hour, but you have that ability to meet that. I feel like that dance between challenge and capability right. is where that flow happens. It sounds right. like that's what's happening. Probably the best way to explain it is... Um, the example of what I did this summer. For years I've been wanting, for some reason, to do calla lilies. They're one of my favorite flowers. And I wanted to do a really nice free-form calla lily. Not a mold. I don't like to use other people's molds. I make my own, but I don't want to use something that somebody else made. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just part of what I feel to be my true self that if I'm going to make something, I need to make it on my own. And over the course of about eight weeks, a lot of thinking, a lot of research, a lot of trial and error, I finally got those calla lilies made. And it was for a wedding gift for a nephew and his bride. I'm very, very happy with it. And along the way, I discovered this current process that I'm using, which now has just opened um, some doors that were totally unexpected to even be there for me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's so it's, I guess part of it is knowing that once I reach what I think is the, the top or the pinnacle mm-hmm. of the process that I'm doing, then I get there, and I know that there's going to be something further uh, ahead of me on that. And that now I know that enough to know that, okay, I'm going to be able to accomplish this, and what is that going to bring me after that? So maybe that's really what is keeping me going. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like you've kind of busted the myth of arrival. You know, that right. like we, we, I think that for many people, myself included, sometimes you buy into that, like, if I get to this certain level or right. I can do this, then, man, then I'm set and easy. But then what you realize, and it sounds like this is what you're describing, is, like, when you do get there, um, you don't want to just sit back right. and coast. Yeah. Like, there's this real, like, sort of pioneer spirit of, like, what... What's what is next? this leading to? Like no, it unlocks I... this whole new opportunity or this whole new door right. that wasn't there. And um, that process almost happens, it sounds like for you with the calla lilies, allowing yourself to do something that you just wanted to do, that you yes. wanted to create. And yes. um, I think sometimes there's this fear that if we follow what we just want to do, we're interested in creating, that that's going to hold us back and almost like this over-calculated. Well, and what I have found um, with having work in galleries, you know, you get hints from the gallery owners, well, you should do this, or this is what's selling well. And right about a year ago, I made a very conscious decision that, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. Because otherwise... I wasn't excited about going out to my studio. It was like, oh, i got to go do this today. I've got to go make, you know, these bowls today, or I've got to put this together. 
And when I once I made that decision to follow myself and pursue that, this past year has just opened up um, visions of what I can accomplish that I had no clue about before. Yeah. You really want to acknowledge you. Right. And if decision. the galleries want to sell what I'm doing, great. And if they don't, mm-hmm. you know, that's okay too. I'm, I have to follow that inner passion of what makes me yeah. move forward. It seems like that's a piece of what keeps the joy yes. there for you. Yes. Because instead of trying to <laughs> configure what is going to sell, what people want. Um, right. It's this idea that you belong to yourself. Right. And I was about to mention that, you know, I'm in a very fortunate place in my life because um, the positions that my husband and I have, particularly my husband, I have that freedom to be able to explore. And because of all the years that we both worked hard, we put away our savings, things like that, we're able to be, you know, I'm able to be quote-unquote retired and now working as an artist, and that's a freedom that I don't take lightly. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if I had found this even when I had a full-time job as a test engineer, I would still be driven, I believe, by what I want to do Mm -hmm. and not what others want me to do Mm -hmm. what they think will sell in their gallery or Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah I I could see that in you yeah (laughs) yeah just that tenacity to if that if you had found what you really wanted to do at that point having the commitment and the tenacity to find a way right to make that work and I think tenacity and persistent are good good words it's Mm -hmm. um definitely a passion but, I, I mean, I can't give up if I wanted to. <laughs> yeah, it almost doesn't let you. It's no, just it like, doesn't let me. Yeah, I'll passion take a day is like off. this fuel of... Right. Yeah. <laughs> My, um, well, for instance, on Monday afternoon, I just, it was a low energy day, and it's like, okay, but I can sit on the sofa, and I can get this done, and I can get that done, and there, you know, some paperwork, working on my um, uh, website, things that I don't have to exert physical or even that much mental Mm -hmm. um, process to it, Mm -hmm. but there's still things that have to be done, and might as well get them done, and quote-unquote take a day off while I was doing it, so it, you know. I think that's what it is about, is recognizing when you don't have the drive to get out to the studio, how can you still feed that passion? Mm, Whether Even if it's inactively. Mm, I I really love that. Yeah. And it's um, sort of what I I call embracing the natural rhythms of life. Sometimes you're passion muse or your creative muses go in strong <laughs> you couldn't <laughs> hold it back if you wanted to right um it's actually it's harder at that point to take breaks to yes. make a meal or to right. go to the grocery store <laughs> um or to have a conversation with your spouse <laughs> um you know but but then there's other times where um if you push that muse it's just the energy isn't there at right. that point and if you pushed it um, you know, you would lose a little bit of the, the joy of the process. But I love what you said is you can always find some way mm-hmm. to inspire that passion. Yes, yeah. I believe so. Now, part of that, I think, comes from the way that I grew up, where, you know, on a dairy farm with a bunch of siblings, we weren't allowed to sit and do nothing. Mm-hmm. So there's a real self-instilled guilt process that comes Mm -hmm. along with it um so maybe I'm actually soothing that guilt as well but it works Mm -hmm. and so then on the next day I can get up and really accomplish a lot more than probably what I would have if I had tried to force my way through it so Mm -hmm. I'm trying to always actively 
use whatever energy, even if it's low energy, Mm -hmm. um, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's that part of that process rather than, you know, maybe it used to come from guilt. (laughs) Um, But I feel like it's coming from, it sounds like, awareness now. More, yeah, there's yeah. definitely awareness. Mm-hmm. Um, the guilt is still there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For it all of in, us. <laughs> it was instilled pretty deeply. That's a whole other process, right? Like we have the right. creative process and then we have the like healing guilt right. and shame process. <laughs> I think um, I always said my mom loved to fish. And I think the reason that she loved to fish is she could sit on the banks of the stream with a fish pole in her hand and catch fish and convince herself that she was still doing something even though she was relaxing and fishing. (laughs) So (laughs) this is my way of sitting on the banks of a stream and fishing and, you know, but I'm, I'm still using it. Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, you're recharging. Yes. For the real, for the real work, Mm -hmm. so to speak. Good. I feel like there's so much more we could we could talk about and explore here. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you so much for well, being willing to talk. Well, you're very welcome. Yeah. I really very welcome. Thank it. you for having me. Yeah. And I really just want to acknowledge, I really respect that tenacity and thank that you. discipline. And you, since I've known you, always an effervescent spirit and just a, a well, can thank you. do. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. Yes. Good. <laughs> I'm so glad. Um, I always, you know, I try to ask uh, if you had, you know, a resource or something to recommend to aspiring creatives, what would you offer to them? I know that's a very broad question, so feel free to go with it. Um, What I'm going to do probably is something that a lot of people are saying don't do, and that is promote social media. Mm. Even as short as just three years ago, the fact that I found um, groups on Facebook Mm -hmm. that are dedicated to fused glass. Some are more for experts, some are more for the science side of it, some are out there just for beginners. You have to weed through what is really good information and what isn't, but that's all a part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's been invaluable. Mm -hmm. And not only from the learning aspect of it, but some of the closest friends in my life I've gained because I've gotten to know them through those groups, Mm -hmm. and they've become true, true, deep friends of mine. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'm so glad that we actually brought that in at the end. Yeah. Um, The value of community. And I'm so glad that you made it also about social media Mm -hmm. and how to really engage in social media groups. Right. That keeps you, it sounds like, out of comparison, out of overwhelm, but really using it for what it is, a tool to connect right. with people. And it can be, I mean, if the group isn't working for you, then find a different group mm-hmm. or start your own group with your own you know, set of friends. And that's one of the things that I've done. It's a very small group, and we're there for each other mm-hmm. no matter what if it's glass or life, Mm -hmm. but um, it's just been invaluable. Mm -hmm. I love that. And if I could sneak one mini question in along those lines. And social media, when you're connecting uh, with these these friends, how do you keep it authentic? I know a lot of people struggle with reaching out in groups and and feeling like they can still be themselves, not rather than a curated image. Oh... I suppose for me, that just goes to I. what you see is what you get. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I suppose even on social media, it's a little bit easier in some ways to kind of hide behind that. But um, I think you just have to be yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, even on social media, people can see through you. Mm -hmm. So what good does it do to try to, you know, be something you aren't? Yeah, I'm really hearing just to show up. Right. To show up in the groups and be there for people. Right. And then just be yourself and Mm -hmm. be willing to be seen as imperfect. Right. Yeah, very important. 
Yes, very important. Good advice, good words of <laughs> advice. Well, again, thank you so much. Well, Such you're welcome. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks for joining us today. To see more of what Evelyn has been up to, find out where to purchase her glasswork, or to host her for a teaching event, reach out via her website, glassfractions.com. Look for the link in the description below. And would you like to stop writing yourself off, develop resilience, and learn to thrive? Click the link below and apply for one of my inspired vision sessions. In your session, we will get really clear what your inspired vision is, what stops you, and what steps will support you in moving forward in your journey. Join me and become unstoppable.